Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in the Red Dusk mod for Hearts of Iron 4. I'm your host, Mr. Mocha Lover. Um, this is a mod set in alternate, alternate 2000, year 2000, in which August coup of 1991 succeeded and the USSR was saved from collapse. So, I don't know what's going to happen. We're still in the USSR and uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and read the country info because I know nothing about this. So if you want to skip ahead a couple minutes, and because you don't want to hear me read about this, please go right ahead. The red sun shines. It had been less than 10 years from that fateful day, August 19th, 1991. When those tanks rolled into Moscow, nobody knew what would, uh, we would be changing history. Nobody understood the gravity of the situation at hand, or the unfolding events that would change the very course of Russia's path. The day it all went down, and the that followed would come to define us, define our glorious union, define our situation for the foreseeable future. It was August coup. Our forces had moved with great haste and swift prejudice. We couldn't watch as our glorious motherland die. We couldn't stand by and watch as they all came apart. And so we did as any reasonable men in our situation would do. We took charge of the problem at hand and we struck it down. Yanayev was correct in many ways in his assumption of how it all played out. How the August coup had been a saving grace at last her off of sorts from the old guard of the Communist Party, how it had, at least for now, preserved the status quo of the Soviet Union. While there was no cell on its revival, the Yanayev regime certainly wasn't the most amiable of Gorbachev's open arms towards the insidious influences of the capitalist and imperialist West. Yanayev and the old guard couldn't sit idly by and watch as a man of little reservations walk all over the spinning image of Lenin's great experiment, the project to redeem the proletariat. And so the coup went through, and for the first time in Russian history, it seemed that for once military action had to progress or regress the nation. Everything stood still as if time itself had frozen around the nation. The reforms came to a halt, certainly, but Yanayev knew a moderate hand was necessary to guide the course of the storm and prevent the total breakdown of the country. That seemingly had worked out, of course, that was what he had originally thought. When, he, when we had committed to the movement, we had put our support behind the coup. We knew there would be consequences, some as dire as members of the states leaving, an economic shock as political upheaval. But then, then, and now, did we know we could deal with it all, one by one, step by step if need be. And yet here we stood, a nation hobbling along with one foot in the open grave, a red, not so vibrant, uh, as a triumph and revolutionary as it once had been. Where was Marx's sunrise? Our glorious red star replaced by red dusk. Uh, we have different guys here, so yes, you can go with the conservative route of Boris Bujo, a certain uh, guy, Vladimir, um, with the KGP, I think, or I guess a reformed communist path. Huh, or Eurasian's path. Uh, Nikolai Avriskov, and Dmitry Yazov. Sounds cool, so we'll see what happens. Um, I'm just, we're, on his, we're on historical. Led by Gennady Yanayev, which you may read it some other time. Uh, oh, oh, this is the guys up here, so. It is what it is, and we'll see what happens. You know, I'm here for fun. The morning after. It had been 83 years since the Aurora fired on the Winter Palace, signaling the beginning of the Soviet era, and it had been 9 years since it almost ended. The catastrophe of Soviet stagnation for the past 20 years culminated in Gorbachev's failed leadership, which in turn created a bigger reaction than was of August Coup of 1991. The fate of the Union hanged in the balance as only the leadership of the GKCHP stopped it from falling over the edge, but now. Nine years later, the situation is no better than before, except now there are no more Yeltsin's or Gorbachev's that take the blame. And the status of the USSR. We'll have to reassess the state of the Soviet Union now that we are back in control. We need a full report of all departments and the economy, including a report on where the enemies of the state are now at. Ethiopia launches a major offense against EPLF. Oh, that's cool. An end to a 38-year-old conflict? Oh, we can aid Africa. Cool. New morning, new millennium. As the morning breeze, Moscow's cold air fell in uh, Sema's face. It felt as if all the joys and smiles we put up during the last week's celebrations were nothing more than a distant memory. Soon the Moscow electric lamp plant, a building he knew all too well, would be in front of him and his desk dropped together with it. Nothing to smile, nothing to whimper over. Just another day at work. This was his trail of thoughts until a sudden all too familiar voice broke it. Semyo, wait, a sore voice almost yelled behind him. As Semyo turned around, he could see the origin of it. A stubby short man in a mechanic clothing staggered slowly towards him. Good day to see you too, Titlov. Are you all right, my friend? You look like you're running down the entire street, Semyo asked the man. I almost died. I've been behind you for the... <clears throat> uh, the short man took a short breath for the past three blocks. I've been calling you, but you seem to be in your own world, as always. The man seemed exhausted, but suddenly just turned to Semyo with a regained breath and continued. Well, my friend, how have you been these holidays? Anything new? No, not really. Me and Lena spent the evening together. Seryoshka uh, was over at Komsmol's uh, party, and that was it. We ate, drank, and watched TV, you know, the usual, Samuel replied to his friend. Yeah, what did you think about Gennady's New Year message? Tetelov coughed into, the, well, into once poor continuing. Gennady's message. To me, it seemed even more watered down than last year. I really don't pay attention to those things, but now I think about it, yes. They just seem to have gotten worse over the years. If only old Lenya was around, he knew what he was doing. Heck, even Mikhail Sergeyevich, for all his crap show, had also sort of goal. Yeah, you know, and his guy seemed like a corpse trying to wear the Lenya's clothing, and it looked saddening. 
Same has stopped himself from continuing as he can see the main entrance of the plant in front of him. There's a little conversation you haven't filled his last block of it. I just hope this might be a better year than last, or even better century. Tetloff smiled before continuing his walk to the plant's workshop entrance. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you around, Semya. You take care. You too, my friend. Oh, it's going to hear. So, people are killing each other. Paternal Autocrats versus Sudan People's Liberation Army. Ideas of a new Sudan. Really good defense, huh? Can we see any volunteers? Um, what is the terrain like here? Is it desert? Hills? Plains? It's a lot of plains. A few sandy deserts. Uh, supply truck attrition. That's not good. Hmm. Not sure if I should really send tanks down there. Uh, marsh, forest, hills. Our defense is not bad. How about you guys? Mechanized division. So we'll see what happens. I mean, I, there's some editing we gotta do with here with all this stuff. Movement's not great. Well, we could try it. Give the old Rambler a try. PDR Africa. Right wing nationalists. I know there's a lot of hills and what mountains and whatnot down here, so maybe just normal artillery would be probably pretty decent to do. Oh crap, I forgot to edit all the other division templates too. So what are we doing down here? Looks like you maybe would want to do this, do this. Also, like I said, I don't know what's going to happen. I didn't pay attention too much, so... If you have any recommendations or tips for me, please leave them in the comments below, because I'd be interested in reading them. Oh, Somalian Anarchy. That's pretty normal. The uh, specter of militarism. Stagnant economy. Ooh. Uh, Marshal of the Soviet Union, uh, General Dmitry Yazov, who had been leading the military's faction of the party, is rising in influence, capitalizing on the reclaiming of Baltics and the Caucasus. Yazov has pushed for an increased funding of the army even higher than its current levels. Because it's come to the point that we need to acknowledge this rising star. Our biggest failures. How could the monolith that was our glorious communist society fail, the greatest, freest, most fairest system in the world? Well, as it turns out, they're in a government bureaucracy through a military coup that replaces the entire strata of said bureaucracy with new faces primarily based on yes men and political affluence. That's a good bit of slowing to be had. When Gorbachev first took office and when he started implementing his reforms, Yanayev claims to have seen it for what it was, capitalism with another name. A mock attempt at the abomination created in Beijing by the Dengis regime. Although they were working for at least some time, Yanayev knew that to preserve the socialist model, he'd have to act quickly to bring it all to a halt. Well, to do that, he had to do a small bit of economic remodeling. Some tariffs here, block, a business blocking there, and of course, go through the almost returning to a military budget proportional to the Second World War. Uh -huh. Yanayev, a party man himself, was backing from the military-industrial complex, and many faces to appease during the wake of the coup, and to do that would cost him, and more importantly, the Moscow treasuries, a large sum to bolster and rebuff our friends in the armed forces, men who deemed demanded larger salaries, men who demanded that we return to an on guard position in the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, men who even begun demanding that we kickstart a new phase of the Cold War to try and harness the economy. While the military-industrial complex does have its charms, and for several years provided many numerous jobs, we eventually ran out of production necessities. We had all the ammo, tanks, aircraft we could ever need, even NATO's imperialistic fingers crawling their way into Eastern Europe, and soon enough, the job started to fall through. Well, we kept spending, kept going. Yanayev knew that once he lost support of the Allies and the military, it was all over, as there would be yet another internal power struggle. Now, with everyone being armed to the teeth. A sudden influx of unemployment into the market was, of course, offset by the brilliant genius of our economic mastery, the controlled economy, allowing us to assign jobs and duties, but by some work of the West, it hasn't done much to improve things. We haven't fallen, per se, but we haven't progressed either. The economy is in clear about a stagnation, a several year long period of failure to advance the well being of a population growing unsettled by the reverting of all Gorbachev's work. Now we're looking down the double barrel of both the economy and the military. <clears throat> a figurative and literal barrel. So what are we doing over here in Ethiopia? Having a good old time, that's right. Nothing but good times in Ethiopia. I forgot to look at planes. Boop, ba, boop, ba, boop. Naval fighters? Interesting. Oh crap, this looks terrible. Um... It's a bad idea, but I'm gonna reorganize these guys maybe. Oh god, is there any faster way to just choose every single one? Let's 
Screw it. Whee! Boop. Goodbye. 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 I'm just going to redeploy all these. Boop. I completely forgot about the Navy as well. Crap. Shove them all into one big old thing. It's fine. And we'll divide them up that way. Uh, can you all come to Leningrad? We'll see. I doubt you guys can, but we'll see. Boop. And Moscow. Boop. Uh -huh. Oh, so we're set at 50, not even 100. Interesting. And Volgograd. And South Sudan. Hmm. Let's see what you can do about this. Yeah, the mod moves pretty fast, though. I do like that. The Fiat Report. The Union had undergone many, many reforms and changes both positive and negative forms. It was a tough time, but we marched on. After extensive investigations in the 1990s, the enemies of the state have been found and removed except Mikhail Bor Gorbachev, as is considered no longer to be a threat to the stability of the Union. Further, the new head of the army is Dmitry Yazov, a feared and capable man who will lead the reformed Soviet army. The new head of the KGB is a promising young man named Vladimir Putin, who will be instrumental of the Soviet Union. Boris Pugo will be permanent minister of the internal affairs as he played a big part in the August coup, so remain in his position. Tough times ahead. Ooh, also, I don't know if uh, this is safe to play. Hopefully. Um, I don't. I really don't. So, war resistance. I'm going to assume no, because I will get copyright struck. Yeah, I definitely will with, with this one. So I apologize for not being able to do a lot of these songs. Stagnating economy. Perhaps one of the biggest symbols of the Soviet Union for the past 30 years have been the ever-stagnating economy. The situation could be a lot worse. It isn't good either. Sure, there are no big signs of any problems with the economy, but the stagnation of productivity, union's isolation from the world trade, half cock reversal of the economy after Perestroika and Yanayev's unsuccessful 1996 reforms, have less significant impact on the Soviet economic sector. The only question is how long can we keep this way? Oh, good God. There's a lot of reading. Yeah, that's what I signed up for. Um, how are you doing down here? Are we down here? Oh, yeah, we are. Oh, you're not winning. That's not good. You'll probably be complaining about lack of supply. But, the elephant in the room. With a growingly discontented population, a stagnating economy, fragile political balance, and a worriedly skewed global order, the last thing the union needed right now is a massive internalized political struggle over the chairman's favor and position. And thus, that's exactly what we've been facing since 1991. When you overthrow a popular government via military means, overturn the entire economic direction of the nation, and you start meddling with the names like Glasnost and Perestroika, you're bound to ruffle some feathers, feathers that are attached to vultures and predators alike, men who will gladly tear us apart from the inside to gain power and see out of their own sick, twisted vision of a glorious union. Men for the military, for instance, hold some of the scarce influence of the lot simply because they hold sway both over the armed forces and, more worryingly, over Yanayev himself. The military's faction, led by one of the Marshal Dmitry Yazov, the military's power derived from their economic grapple over the military industrial complex, and because they control the very entity that helped Gennady Yanayev take control in the first place, what Yazov says comes with a friendly attached letter that will gladly and openly put into fresh words or else. Or two, which though not literal haunts the general secretary day by day. A traditionalist of the Soviet system, Yazov and his gang are not to be underestimated. Not all good soldiers follow orders. Even the president of the Supreme Soviet wasn't safe, with men like Boris Pugo, a secretary of the interior, working. At his own goals, to see the USSR rebuilt in an image that was almost mirrored by his former compatriots and the late secretary Yuri Andropov. A plan to return to the strongly command, strong command economy, a crackdown on internal dissent and corruption, a strong yet anti-war approach to America and the NATO snakes. While the military holds sway due to its might, Pugo and his cronies exercise their strength by how close they sit to Yanayev. Some friends, uh, some keep friends close and enemies closer, and the lines blur on who's who, that becomes a much more risky game of cat and mouse. 
Uh, let's not forget to, uh, to add the poll that the chairman of the Council of Ministers and Gorbachev's former associate, Nikolai Reskov, who's still out there and still pushed for economic liberalization and political reforms. How do people still like him? Or like him, still hold positions when we tried removing them 10 years ago? Well, that may come down to policy still. Yeah, and he will never admit that giving people greater political and economic autonomy has a driving force there. Rykov and his ideas, while not being Gorbachev and his failed policies, is still a danger. He poses they're almost as great as the upstart. <coughs> that upstart just happens to be the originator from the KGB. A young and spry man, head of the organization for that matter. How uh, he would happen to be Vladimir? Information is not for public view. Build a nuclear warhead. With access to weapons grade uranium, we could construct a nuclear warhead for use. That'd be cool. Uh, the party factionalism. Since its foundation, the CPSU founded it and prouded itself in the, being the party of the workers uncorrupted by infighting as a united force. In reality, however, the party is divided among the lines of interest and political gain, like normal. The factionalism within the party only increases uh, increase after the August coup, with each faction wanting to stay in the way the union is ruled. Each faction has a varying amount of power. While it might benefit from a faction's effects if the power is high, it'll take political power away, and vice versa if the power is low. So, conservatives, politicians that want to keep the old system and solve governance. Uh, uh, conservative faction combining prominent leaders from other factions ousted the reformist uh, leader Mikhail Gorbachev in the August coup of 1991. With militarists, a group of composed mostly of military members and some politicians as he competing with the USA economically and attempting to peace with the capitalists always lead to failure, thus viewing military power of the Soviet Union. The only way to show worldwide communism provided a massive boost in the 91 coup, causing them to gain multiple political positions and favors in the government. Reformists, group politicians are mostly young idealists that are disappointed with the current Soviet system and want to return to be capable and ready for the future. Reformers lost most of the political sway they had after the ostation of Mikhail Gorbachev. With their most prominent leaders arrested, the reformist movement mainly shifted into more limited reformism, and then we had the KGB, commonly known as the Committee for State Security. It's the main security agency in the Soviet Union that manages most of the internal security, foreign intelligence, counterintelligence, and secret police functions. It gained political relevance after helping out and arresting counter-revolutionaries and American agents out of the ostation of Gorbachev in Africa. Through strategic aid, will simply supply the MPLA in Angola against UNITO, and also uh, Mengitsu's regime in Ethiopia against Eritrean independence fighters and the anti-communist insurgency, strengthening the global front of communism against imperialist and reactionary forces. What is this? Morale boost of propaganda. Launch a propaganda campaign to boost the morale and fighting spirit of the MPLA soldiers. Well, they're not getting attacked. I guess we sent them some guns, provide the MPLA with a shipment of modern infantry weapons so it strengthen their frontline troops. That's fine. Soviet military advisors? Oh, deploy experienced Soviet, Soviet military advisors to assist in the MPLA in planning and executing operations. Oh, I don't mind that one. Uh, uh, fine, you can recover faster too. We'll support you. For now. And the rising dis dissidents. Dissidence has always been a problem in our country ever since the Great October Socialist Revolution, but in this period of perennial crisis, the dissidence has become one of the greatest problems of our country, especially in our new generation that has become weary of the Communist Party and are looking for alternatives. The situation in the Baltics hasn't made anything easier. If we want communism to survive, we need to deal with this dissidence problem as soon as possible. An old man, but an older nation. And we've got a lot of other parties outlawed, too. Yaniyev cannot sit on his laurels forever. The Union is facing some of the worst issues since the spring of 56, and things don't seem to be improving. With the economy in shambles, the political landscape of the nation on the brink, tossing Russia into yet another form of mad dash for power, and with the world staring at Moscow waiting for a response, the aging chairman is starting to feel the weight is not only Russia, but the entire globe, barreling down on his shoulders. He'll be turning 63 this year, and all the stress from this coup, failing policy, and inability to act given he had to play nice with so many internal factions. Uh, the public outcry, mounting diplomatic forces, was perhaps too much for his frail shoulders to bear anymore. How much longer could little Kennedy keep at the game? How much longer could he just try to carry on the mantle of Marx or Comrade Lenin? Frankly, he didn't even know the answer to that question. He was an old male with enemies on all sides, enemies masquerading as friends, and friends acting like enemies. He was stuck in suffering, and with him, too, so was the Soviet Union stuck in suffering. There would be no quiet recovery. There couldn't be any way to fix these issues by sitting back and praying for the best. Russia didn't need a hero. He needed a savior. And for the first time in his life, Yanayev was starting to doubt his ability to carry that title. Could he, could anyone, really save Russia at this point? And the factions bounding up for the coming party meetings. And with the entire nation sitting on the edges of other seats, waiting in anticipation for an answer from the Kremlin, it would all come down to this. The chairman's position was crumbling around him. Russia, though only stagnating now, showed no signs that recovery was on the horizon. We tried our best to keep it all together, but it's coming to a point where we don't know what the future holds for all of our beloved Union. Another coup? Economic depression? Or, God forbid, a total collapse? The Cold War has necessarily been a battle of nations, a battle of values, or even a battle of ideologies. It's been a struggle for the very fate of Earth, time and time again, where men, for reasons even they do not at times comprehend, will put everything on the line over one big red button, the button that could bring about the end of times, the end of mankind itself. These are horrifying realities that we're facing, and for once, we couldn't hide it under propaganda, under dissidents of suppression, where was a red star? Obscured and hidden in the sands of time. Who do we have here? Bugo, huh? Oh. 
Yuri Maslyukov, Alexander Bes Besmertinik. I'm probably saying that wrong. I want to help out and attack, but it doesn't make any sense for us to do it like this, you know? Actually, we're doing okay. Pasela wins 2000 Croatian elections. Well, good job for Croatia, I guess. See, as long as we're leading the attack, we're okay. We know what we're doing. Oh, we kind of know what we're doing. I don't know if we. I know exactly what we're doing, but we're doing something. Are you in here? Or giants walk Moscow hobbles. It all comes down to this. This is our make or break moment. Russia and the glorious motherland shall either prevail or shall she fall into the annals of history. We already lost the member states of Secession and the coup. We already lost our economy to the flow of stagnation. And seemingly, we've already lost the will of our people. How can we have to win? How can we survive? We want to figure out one way or another. We cannot give in nor surrender. We cannot accept defeat laying down. We'll bear the mantle of Lenin, all the workers of the world. We beat the Nazis. We beat the capitalists of the stars. We beat their gods, beat their will, and beat their way of life. And now all we need is a home push to prove it. Now, surely, it isn't all propaganda. It isn't helpful dreaming and ranting, right? The U.S. has faced their own peril in recent years. Surely, that's a sign. The Europeans in the Federal Union have failed to gain major traction in the Eastern Bloc. At the time, they wish to return to their friends in Red Square. No, NATO hasn't invaded yet, which too is a great success. And we'll sell our seats under the United Nations Security Council, so obviously we're still capable and strong nation, right? Right? The Red Desk hasn't come out yet, right? Ethiopia requests extra divisions. Recently, our allies in Ethiopia launched a surprise offensive. They defeat the U.S. backed separatist rebels that have plagued the stability of the country and regi region. Communists in Ethiopia were able to win an earlier civil war after extensive military aid from us, becoming a viable ally in the Soviet sphere, and today. Um, Ethiopians approaching your government and requesting an extra divisions to help them out in the military operations. Well, they already have enough. Of course we'll help our African allies. You only get plus two volunteers for 50 days. That doesn't seem great. Plus two? Meeting with high command. The Soviet army, no matter how you looked at it, was only the, f the only force keeping uh, the peace in the fra ever fracturing union. Now, that was increasingly failing to quell uprisings and separatist movements. But despite their best efforts, the consistently liberal reforms of the General Secretary have seen the once mighty Soviet army reduced to a mere paper tiger, one that can't even enforce law and order within its own borders, yet alone the world. For many, this is a breaking point. Conspiracies of all manners begin to spread like cancer among the CPSU. One such conspirator is Ministry of Minister of Defense, Dmitry Azov, who have been critical of Yana Yev's liberal policies ever since the coup. He and his fellow co conspirators have taken upon themselves to organize a meeting only for the highest members of the military. This meeting took place in the barracks on the far outskirts of Leningrad, far from the eyes of the spineless bureaucrats of Yana Yev. Yeah, Yazov made his concerns over the high command if they did not step in. The union may have, uh, they had fought so hard to protect would crumble like a house of cards. Only the army, the backbone of the Soviet proletariat, would, could ensure the continuous prosperity of the USSR and finally restore its place as a superpower on the world stage. With that, goal, with that, with that the goal is clear. It's either the army's triumph or the union's death, and so it begins. Hmm. Nobody realizes we're smart about all this stuff. Maybe do that over there. Win there. Or you could have to just encircle them. That also works too, probably. No, no nukes though. Yuri is a kisser or seducer. Oh, yeah, I forgot about you guys too. There you go. Hey, nice job. Help them out. There you go, nice job, guys. I think we're doing pretty well so far. The economy report. The economy has never been, been as it is now. Even during the beginning of the Great Patriotic War, it wasn't bad. Blockades, sanctions, and economic wars have been imposed on us by the West for over 50 years now. All of them with one goal to cripple us. Sad to say, it appears that they were working. The Union's only future is either reform or vanish. Over our over-militarized economy is no, no help either. As such, we can show our tech teeth to the West. If we're going to take care of our people first, it'll lead to a disaster. We'll have to reform the Union of the People. Uh, oh, we'll have to reform, or the Union of the People will not last. The capitalists will pay. The rising dissidents, too. And then we have Yana Yev's final weeks. Everyone knows Gennady Yana Yev's days, chairman of the Soviet Union, are numbered, especially to failing to deliver the prosperity and peace he promised to the people after the coup of 91. But I don't want to go all out with a fight, so we'll bear before the inevitable worse happens. Our chairman will do one last attempt at improving his situation, and that of the motherland, but whatever reason he will succeed in his attempt or not, it's a whole different story. My apologies, I was wanting to crack this fat back of mine. Uh, we could do that. Intensive training program. Implement intensive training program to enhance the combat readiness and effectiveness of the MPLA forces. Uh, supply modernization program. Oh, that's not bad. Weekly war support because of better supply consumption. Implement a comprehensive supply modernization program to enhance logistical efficiency and reduce uh, supply consumption of the Ethiopian army. Reinforce frontline divisions. 
So additional Soviet equipment, some manpower to strengthen the Ethiopian frontline divisions. I like that one too. We could do that one. Or we just do the job herself. I wish we get support here to help. There you go. You might be going there still. Angola. Oh, no. Nice job, guys. Alright, so that's mined. You are what? Offensive? That's right. Well, no command power. Never mind. You're not offensive. Should be able to win here now. Especially taking the port. Well, I guess there is nothing else there. Wait, what happened? There you go. A bad morning, as the column of the tra trucks laid charred from the fire, blocking one of the Vilnius Kalnas Road, Captain Maloshenko passed a group of soldiers guarding the covered bodies of the dead Soviet soldiers killed in the convoy ambush. He soon approached Colonel Stepankov, who seemed seancing to see what was to come around before turning to the captain. What is it now, Captain? Comrade Colonel, I came to you to propose a new plan of action. This convoy, which symbolizes all of our efforts so far, have been pointless. The more these actions that go unpunished, the more daring these terrorists become. A week ago, it was the bridge of Raventa. Today, this and to spit it out, Malchenko. I don't have time for this whole darn day to listen to your philosophy. Right, right. I vowed they would take stricter action. For each one of these attacks, we'll execute civilian involved. Enough, for God's sakes, Malchenko. I'm not going to authorize firing squads, and neither would the command. We're the army of the Soviet people, not the Nazi penal units. Just do your darn job and secure the road. Is that understood? Colonel Side once more looked out of the paper with a report of the ambush. No, Comrade Colonel, Captain answered, unamused the Colonel's words. I know that they won't stop, but continue to sit around and do nothing as their numbers grow, and you know too. The Colonel even raised his head this time, speaking to the Captain, uh, with a voice of disappointment. The last time, I won't authorize anything that you come up with. They hate us enough already as is. Economic reforms. Ooh, it's going to destroy political power. It gives it more consumer goods, which is nice. The biggest problem of our country right now is the everlasting economic crisis that has been gripping us ever since the 80s, with no sign of letting go anytime soon. Our chairman, Yanayev, is to invent new economic reforms so that his promised economic growth somehow happens and his grip and credibility as chairman remain firmly in place. Let's hope these so called reforms work at least, you know. Reinforce frontline divisions. Potential training. Fine, you can that one too. How are we doing down here? And how are we doing up here? Century leap here. Look at that. On the clock, you just keep on ticking. Death of Nelson Mandela. Coup in Azerbaijan. Oh boy. Decrease of commodity production. Working around the clock. Defunding the military. These are the times of crisis and the dire times we need to fund a sector of our economy to have more money to spare. And after a detailed analysis, we discovered that the military budget has been high ever since the coup. So we decided to fund the military and direct these funds elsewhere. We're of course aware that this will anger the militarists very much, but some unpleasant things have to be done in order to improve our situation. Nice job. Oh, the Cubans are here. Look at that. Running out of steam from time to time. Economic reforms. Work around the clock. The USSR's economy is currently in its weakest position and needs to immediately solve the issue. The workforce of the Union shall work harder and longer for the betterment of the country and its industry. Khartoum. Okay then. There you go. Happy April, everybody. Sudanese enter Khartoum, nice. Oh. Nice job, we won one of them. Yay. To new, new Sudan.
Yazov protests. The Marshal Yazov issued a protest against Yaniyev's decision of defending the army in his letter. He stated that a country without a strong military cannot defend the workers' revolution. As much as he is right, we cannot focus on the only military, only on the military, while people worry about the future. This has triggered a party meeting about all the recent actions in the current state of the Soviet Union. You should know its place. As you work around the clock. Decrease commodity production. In the heart of the stagnant USSR, the once thunderous roar of industry and progress has dwindled to a desolate whimper. Whisper. Oh, look at that. The tremendous Soviet machine, which has propelled humanity into the cosmos and forged an industrial titan, now confronts the specter of its own decay. In these dark hours, the leaders of the nation call upon a drastic measure, one that harkens back to the tires of times, the Great Patriotic War. Under the weight of an economic strain and political turmoil, the Soviet Union must now pull back on the production of its commodities. The focus shifts from the abundance to necessity. From growth to survival, as the machine of industry slows and amenities dry up, a somber reality sets in. It's a tragedy born of necessity, a painful contraction to preserve the very soul of the Union. Hey, look at that, very nice. Oh, and the other division goes bye-bye too. Yay, good job, guys. They can go in. We're not going in there. Uh, it should be fine too. anti kabila alliance collapses. Look at that. I'll keep going. I'd love to attack, but uh, they need us here. They really do. Oops, wrong button. Boop. Quantity over quality. In these towns, you do not need professionalized equipment, but rather the more equipment to ensure that each and every soldier has a means to protect the Union from its enemies. Uh, I think we need that one. Morale propaganda boost. Some guns. Why not? Ethiopian divisions have really started killing themselves super hard. Force it. Oh, no boot you passes away, huh? There you go. That's how you do it. Ah, military factories, look at that. So what are we missing here? We need more fuel. Close air support. There you go. EPLF forces defeated. After years of fighting considerable casualties from both sides, the EPLF has been finally defeated by the Ethiopian army after the success of Operation uh, Werdwali. Ethiopia's leader, uh, Mengitsu Hail Mariam, thanked the Soviet Union and Cuba for the aid in the war on a victory parade in the northern city of Asmara. With the military lying defeated, the remaining soldiers of the EPLF escaped to Sudan and Saudi Arabia to avoid getting captured by the Ethiopian authorities. What happened to the EPLF's leader, leader Isaias F. Warki, is currently known. Congratulations to the Ethiopian allies. Can you say any more? Darn it, we cannot. Do you guys get an airbase at all? Darn it, we don't. Democracy in Taiwan, ew. Can you win there? Yeah, you might be able to. Administrative reform. While our economic situation is mediocre, to put it mildly, the situation in the halls of power isn't getting better by any means, with rampaging corruption among the party, a suffocating bureaucracy, and a party more focused on bickering rather than finding solutions to our problems. But fortunately, Chairman Yanayev said enough and will implement new reforms so that all the problems will be no more in the USSR or the future. At least let's hope so. The party infighting, huh? Further into looking into the administration, it shows that a lot of factions feel sidelined out of the coup. Feeling like used to all those thrown away. A few concessions to the, uh, to the other factions of the political sphere will help us ease the tensions within the party. Oh! Hey, look at that. The People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola, MPLA, has officially declared victory in the country's long-running civil war, which began in 75, following Angola's independence from Portugal. After more than a decade of fighting against rival factions supported by the Western and Soviet powers, the MPLA has emerged as a dominant force in the country. The MPLA's victory is expected to have significant implications for the wider region, as it represents a major setback for the South Africa's apartheid regime, which has been backing the rival National Union for the Total Independence of Angola, UNITA, rebels. A bunch of liberals here, huh? Hmm. Africa's World War. Cool. The MPLA has pledged to prioritize the reconstruction, reconstruction and development of Angola, which is devastated by the long and bloody civil war. And do they have a war up here too? Yeah. General Autocrat's Islamic Salvation Army. 
People's Democratic Republic of these guys. Huh. Huh. Well. Eradicationists. I don't know. I won't go back to Africa. So far, we've been alright so far. Which is great. Boop. Boop. I could use our help. Oh, we're building some civvies and millies, which is nice too. Seven divisions trapped here. Wow. Ah, they're fighting the mountains and whatnot. We don't have enough command power to force the attack, so. Construction, cool. Yep. 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 And all gain. Well, I guess at this point we could use more fuel too. Hafiz al Assad passes away. Rest in peace. Well, it sucks to be, man. I'm sorry. But it is what it is. I kind of want to force it to see what happens, but at the same time, I kind of don't. And I'll see these guys are looking pretty weak, so we're going to come back over here, maybe, and see what we can do in the north. Yeah, got some rubber, too. I'm sure we could use rubber. Yeah. We got negative on the rubber. Learning, jungle rat, organizer, infantry leader, ranger. Great. Making a couple concessions here and there. Talk with uh, Krechkov. As Dean enters the new millennium, we also need advice from our elders on how we should continue to lead the country into the future. Vladimir Krechkov, a very important ally in the 91 Cuba, leading the KGB in his successfully arresting Gorbachev and the killing of Yeltsin. Krechkov led the KGB efficiently until his retirement and mentored KGB's rising star and current leader, Vladimir Putin. Although he's retired from all politics, it would be wise for us to get advice from him on the current uh, situation. You know, body won't really want, that's fine. I mean, they're not looking super strong either, but still. See what you can do. I might recommend this one. Crush the Liberian government. Huh. Doing this, we're going to destroy them too. Disaster in Paris, oh boy. The end of the supersonic age. Mass making concessions. Come on, AI. Make an encirclement. Do something you can be proud of. There you go. Hey, there you go. See? Not bad. I'm not even sure this is the right group we should be supporting, but whatever. Look at that. Constantine? Do not let them move. Well, we got off another division. Yaniyev's legacy. A surprisingly great morning. Now, one not often seen in the rural outskirts of the Russian SFSR, Yaniyev, dressed in a firm suit and a dress pants, approached the villa. One larger than most any home we could find in the urban hacks of Leningrad of Moscow. He was greeted by a man slowly bloated and visu visibly aged. Without a second, Yaniyev was invited in and treated to drinks and treats. But Yaniyev yeah, didn't come for drinks or treats, but to talk about the ongoing policies of the USSR for the seemingly bloated and elderly man was Vladimir Krechikov, Krechikov, former head of the KGB. The talks began innocently enough, catching up and discussing one of another's current and former careers, but then gradually talks began to shift from the innocent chatter of friends to more serious talks of governing and rule, and it is expected to quickly turn sour. Say what you want, Yaniyev, yeah, but our nation's in turmoil. We may have stopped from crumbling, but this does not make it stable. If you continue your reforms, I warn you that you'll make yourself an enemy to every man who will work to see that our great nation continue to the next century. Reform is what got Gorbachev ousted, and it's well we'll get you voted out by the party. At least while you can, if it weren't for my weak heart, I'd be back in there fighting tooth and nail to keep this country afloat. But alas, that's where it was head deep. Yaniyev knew that he spoke the truth. Soon he would either be removed from his political his position quietly, like Khrushchev was, going down in history as another weak politician who was too ill fit for his position, or he would stop his reforms and give up his position as general secretary, perhaps retiring and saving what reputation he has left. Only Yaniyev knows the answer, he doesn't like the look of either. Maybe. Calming down the party factionalism. A communist part of the Soviet Union has been filled with factionalism. 
of politicians making decisions based on political thinking instead of for the betterment of the nation. If the USSR wants to claw back into the world stage, we need to deal with this important internal issue. Without factionalism, decision making in the Union becomes significantly easier. Address a party. The CPSU has many issues, maybe perhaps even too many to list, but there's a few key ones that always seem to come up to the surface at every Congress and at every Politburo meeting. Corruption, lack of stability, deviations from Marxism, Leninism, lack of reforms, you get the idea. The NEF has to address these problems in one way or another, and the time when they could have been swept under the rug no longer exists. Now it remains to be seen which faction will get the most out of him. Alright, so I forgot about all this stuff. Uh, all tax subs. Boop, boop. Nice. I just hope this is not copyright struck. I have a feeling it is. I'm sorry. Ooh. Sorry. I just don't know. A lot of naval fighters, too. Oh, we got, huh? No carry fighters, eh? Sure, make some carry fighters. Um, do we have any other airbase that is like a lot? We really don't get very much fuel at all, do we? That happens September 1st. Oh yeah, they're definitely suffering here. The Fifty Shades of CPSU. While factionalism has been present within our party since the days of the RSDRP a century ago, the fact that it's almost pro paralyzing any form of progress in their state is defeating. The yeah, of his militaries are not willing to budge from their plans of expanding the defense budget, almost mirroring the late de defense minister Ustinov. While they are right in these terms of, or times of capitalist world hegemony, Union's military must be the height of its readiness. It, it is impossible that our economy could support such a huge and expensive effort, and for what for? Uh, some war that might never come to be. Few go as conservatives, so most of the influence in the, the CPSU, considering that they have existed within the party since the Brezhnev's uh, era, and only have expanded further by filling the seats abandoned by Gorbachev's reforms following the 1991 coup. They tend to return to the party to the days of stability that marked the Brezhnev era, or to the very least maintain the current course. Well, the plan is the most realistic one. We can expect them to do anything about uh, the CPSU's largest problem in the past two decades, stag stagnation. The right coffin is a reformist that consists of a rather small amount of CPSU's members and functionaries. Being previously tied to Gorbachev didn't give them a good look in the past two years, but since they have officially cut all ties with him and his clique, they've been kept around to appease a portion of the population that grew to love some benefits of the Glasnost and Perestroika, the Soviet youth. It is clear that something needs to be changed with the party's policies in the Union, but can we really afford another Gorbachev? Putin and his unofficial clique of KGB apparatchiks is a rather unusual group within the party. They are a rather diverse group which consists of people who could be aligned with any other factions. What is the ultimate goal and policy of Vladimir Vladimirovich? It's still not clear, but it's safe to assume that he has more to do with personal gain and power rather than a concrete policy and ideology. And there's the old Yanayev, a man eaten by age and burdened of carrying a corpse of the country, which is the USSR. While well, officially leads the 91 coup and reverted most of Gorbachev's reforms, he was never a staunch hardliner like Hugo, nor a reformist like Koreko. At best, Yanayev is a compromise, or someone who tried everything to keep the country afloat and the party stable. At worst, he is an old man with the record of a bad leadership decisions, unfit for position which he finds himself in. Union's leader, alone and surrounded. The Millennium Senate. Oh, well, we'll do it that. The Millennium Summit has been held at the UN headquarters in New York City, being the largest gathering of the world leaders in history. It has presented countries with a unique opportunity to negotiate and clarifying agreements, as well as for the United Nations to set out a firm vision for the future. Both President Dan Quayle and General Secretary Gennady Yanayev delivered a plea for disarmament and a reduction of global conflicts, with a particular focus on the growing violence in Palestine and East Timor. Or tomorrow, Palestine, huh? Attempts were also made to bolster peacekeeping forces, with Prime Minister Tony Blair proposing an overhaul of the entire system, however, this attempt was quickly struck down by both Dan Quayle and Gennady Yanayev, with both providing a variety of reasons for why their nations would not support the cause. Nothing unexpected, of course. This isn't working. This is bad. For almost a decade, Yanayev had tried again and again to keep the country afloat. While his managed to stop it from collapsing, we cannot say the same or that the future looks bright. Economic, political, and ideological problems have finally caught up with him, and he seems to be in no position to deal with it anymore. Union's eyes have been pointed in his direction, and he finally has to admit that he's not a man fit for the role anymore. 
and change needs to be had in the leadership. Yep, happy September 7th, everybody. Yeah, we're going here too. How much have you learned? How much have you learned? Yeah, it's becoming a mountaineer too. I like that. And relatively quickly to eat for it to boast. Yeah, look at that. You know, this is not the ideal template. Um, well, stuff we're behind in tech. Oof. Mobile warfare, guerrilla warfare, combined warfare, huh? I don't think I'll take this one. It's like mass assault. Aggressive mobility, terror tactics, coordinated offensives, combined warfare. This is, uh. It looks like, what would they call it? Grand Battle Plan, yeah. Heavy infantry organization. And of course, mobile warfare is mobile warfare. Yeah. Fire brigades, you get some population here. Volkssturm, people in wheelchairs still. Infantry fighting vehicles, it depends what we want. Struggling in the mountains, a bitter truth. Yeah, again, the yeah, yeah, yeah. I was never good at giving speeches. This performance of the press conference back in 91 proves that more than any other speech he gave. Now, none, nonetheless, he's been the leader of the world's superpower. He's made hard decisions before, so this speech shouldn't be any problem to him, however. Knowing that the party itself is more divided than ever, he had to make a choice here. There were many things he could criticize today, but if he did, his speech would be have no, a slight, no end in sight. Therefore, he had to make a choice. As he stepped to the podium and facing hundreds of party members and cameras, he began a speech. First of all, he was praising the recent successes of the Union in both economic and political fields, as well as in science. After what seemed like an eternity, he got to the hardest part of the speech, a critic of the Union's many problems. As he started crying, his watch began as a critic of lack of military readiness, corruption in the party, Lack of reforms, party's lack of control. Well, I don't know. Either way, um, people probably want me to go all sorts of different routes. Why not? Mm. Influence is most here. I might just go conservatives. Because um, they're in the power. And we're on historical, so conservatives. Is that the historical route? I have no idea. I think militaries would be cool. I might go with conservatives. Eventually, we will probably play this route several different times, so we'll go with that route. If we win here, we win the entire war, so fighting must be difficult. 2007 Berlin Olympic Games, nice. This ain't working. Yaniyev's resignation in 1991. Gennady Yaniyev took over as leader of the Union in a coup d'etat in order to save her motherland from those that wanted to destroy it and return or restore the capitalist order. But ever since those fateful days of August, late August, his promises have failed and economic growth never came. The people of the Baltics continue to resist and we still remain in the shadow of our former selves. It's a great country and needs a fresh start. And if Gennady Yaniyev loses, loves his country, he knows what he has to do. Happy October, everybody. Hey, look at that. All right, so who's killing themselves now still? Oh, Afghanistan? Do we want to get there? Uh, Sierra Leone. And Second Congo War. Uh-huh. Paternal Autocrats versus Social Democrats. Either one we don't really care about. Okay. And then Afghanistan. Islamic. Authoritarian Democrat. Frozen War. Wow. Way less attack, more defense. Islamic fanaticism, hardened fighters. Taliban, we don't like the Taliban, probably. Uh huh. Do you have a unique focus tree? Yeah, you do so. I need to find down there. 
A troubling letter. No, it can't be. It just can't be. We did everything. How can it possibly not be working? Yana looked at this economic report that the union's economic, economic ministry delivered to him. After putting his papers on the desk, he sat back in his chair, looking at the clock only. To be, then he realized it was well past midnight. Almost 20 hours without sleep. For what? Another failure? He just sighed and talked to himself. All over all the other general secretaries before him, perhaps it was time for him to finally consider retirement. After all, party could decide who could replace him. Maybe Kotchikov could come out of retirement, make temporary leadership until the party sorts itself out. Still couldn't really leave it empty. Besides, main players like Pugo and Yazov, there were already many more, ready to tear each other apart as soon as either resigned or kicked the bucket. But whatever he was thinking in that moment was quickly dashed aside as soon as the secretary entered. Comrade Yenayev, I'm delivering a letter from the Politburo. They requested that this letter be sent urgently to you, he said. Yanayev took the letter in his hands and dismissed the secretary, opening it and didn't know what to expect, but it was a feeling it couldn't be anything good. The letter was rather long, perhaps too long for him to read it at this hour, but continue. The structure and language were formal as per usual, but the contents of the census were rather serious. Due to failures of initiatives in both economic and political sectors, as well as overall lacking leadership, the Politburo considers your resignation or early retirement to be placed as one of the issues on the next session of the party's central committee. Yanayev sat there, in total silence as he reread the entire paragraph again and looked at the list of signatures of all the members of the Politburo. This can't be, he knew the party was displeased with his leadership for the past several years, but it still came as a shock to him. He just placed the letter back on the table and stood up to look outside the window. Perhaps they're right. Federal Republic of Germany, huh? Treaty of Vientiane. Oh, look at that. Gerhard Schroeder. Krupp and Kraus. Economic Powerhouse. Gardens of Europe. Tony Blair. Chirac. Italy. SFR. Reform Communist. Oh, wow, look at that. The Thai military seizes power. Oh, they have a new focus in, in uh, Yugoslavia, too. Republic of Bulgaria. Oh, look at that. We have another ship here, too. I like that. Um, what are you missing? Attack helicopters? And more cast. There you go. And his resignation. The end of an era. Well, it's a new situation, I must say. A tall figure in the suit said to Yanayev, who was rereading after the script as the television staff shuffled around, preparing the lights and cameras in his office in the Kremlin. Ever since Khrushchev, no other general secretary has ever officially resigned, let alone in front of the whole union. Indeed, Grishin. However, the political bureau, the central committee, and everyone important to the CPSU has received and approved my resignation request. Now, the only ones that need to be informed are the people. Yanayev was rather calm, contrary to what Grishin would expect from a man who's willingly resigning from one of the most powerful positions in the world. The man responded to Yanayev's word both in a both reassuring and concerned tone. It seems so. I mean, at least you can walk out after this with your heads up, knowing that you did the best that could have been done for the Union. But I still have a bad feeling about this. If the party has been divided before, it will surely become worse now. Not to mention the economy. Um, don't break your heads over too much. I've given instruction to the Plitty Bureau. As much as all of them crave power, at least they all wish the Union to remain united so that it should hold off until it's all resolved. I guess, whatever happens, just know it in my, in my still early career, you have been one of the most memorable general secretaries, Comrade Yanayev. Has been honored being your secretary for the past two years. Grishin saluted the soon to be former general secretary. Before Yanayev could think Grishin, a man from the TV crew walked over to inform Yanayev to wait for the signal to start a speech. After a few seconds, the signal was given, and Yanayev began speaking to the camera in a live broadcast. In seven minutes and 46 seconds, one terribly and troubled era of the Soviet history ended, and to many it was a slight, slight relief, but to some it was a sign that the dark clouds were gathering over the Union, destiny way to the USSR. The Party Congress. The 30th Congress of the CPSU is looking to be a decisive one. For now that Chairman Yanayev has announced his resignation. Now, sadly, every faction inside the party will begin to fight each other without Yanayev's authority to calm his waters. But despite that, we need to take this opportunity to set a new course for a union that will bring us back on top of the world where we belong. If this will happen, it is unknown, but one thing is certain. During this Congress, the union's fate will be chosen. Now, look at this. Well, we got rid of the guy. Uh, the latest news coming out of the USSR has shocked the world as Gennady Yanayev, the man who was the main instigator of the August coup that preserved the Soviet Union, has resigned today from the position of General Secretary. With numerous speculations, rumors, theories, and very little information directly from the Kremlin about the development, not much known about the reasons for his extraordinary move. Multiple political experts assume that this is either due to Yanayev's incapability to fix the Union's uh, economic issues or pressure from within the CPSU itself. Whatever the case may be, this is a truly unexpected event that might just have to change the future of the Soviet Union. As of right now, Valentin Pavlov has been chosen by the CPSU to be a temporary general secretary. Time for a regime change? Extraordinary meeting of the Central Committee. 
Yeah, I know you have resignations brought a shock to the USSR's political scene, but not to the party and the leadership itself. Resignation of the top party leader, like this hadn't happened since Khrushchev in 64, however. Both the CPSU and the Political Bureau were ready to vote Yanayev out if necessary. His own move had just sped up the process and made it easier. Despite that, the political infighting has remained an extraordinary meeting of the Political Bureau has been called in state temporary leadership. Due to the factions' mistrust towards each other, a political outsider was chosen, Valentin Pavlov. The former premier after the August coup had resigned from his post due to health reasons a while ago, but remained an active member of the Political Bureau and the Central Committee. Hence why he was chosen to his non-existent influence and ties into the inner political factions. Let's see what Pavlov will do for a week. Welcome aboard. Valentin Pavlov. Attempted to coup in Yugoslavia. Business as usual. Oh, no. <coughs> Good old party and fighting. Daily game. Oh, look at that. Thousands of yes, please. Uh, arrange. Um, mm, more reliability and cap. Ah, uh, screw it. Up. Better off right now. Let's see what happens. The party meeting is probably the last one we do for this episode because I don't know what else is going to happen. Republicans re-elected. Oh, look at that. Dan Quill, conservative, Republican Party. Party meeting. Second Amendment. Love that. Uh, it's been several days after Yanni have resigned as the General Secretary of the Party Congress has begun. Tensions in the hall were high, just many wait for the opportunity to grab the position of the most powerful man in the USSR. Many of those backstabs uh, and the shitty actions have been going on uh, far from the public's eyes and ears, however. Even this long meeting has come to an end. As the speaker walked behind the microphone in the main stand, the final voting began. The next leader of the Union of Soviet Social Republics is Boris Pugo. I guess welcome aboard, Boris. God, I hope I don't have hair like you someday. Fixing this mess, well, the conservative, I guess. Pugo knows that the best choice of action to save the Union is to keep it on its course. Uh, that Lenin once set it up for 1923. Going off the explored path can only lead to dangerous results, and Pugo knows it. Preparing the cards, we'll prepare how to deal with our enemies later on, is attacking them unprepared, oh, oh, only weakness. Well, we got an theater. First episode was interesting, and we've got issues in the crisis in the Balkans. But hey, if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. I will continue on trying to reform the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, and lead it, well, maybe not reform, but lead into a nation of uh, uh, prosperity, especially you know, the conservatives. What is conservative communists? Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.